folks about the value uh, of the cultural resources that we have, primarily uh, historic architecture. We do advocacy to help people understand the importance not only of historic architecture, but uh, other policies like historic preservation tax credits and things that incentivize the preservation of historic architecture. Uh, we do have expertise on our commission that helps people who are seeking to nominate a site or a structure for historic preservation uh, uh, for the like designations and those sorts of things. We can assist with that and providing technical assistance for folks who are undertaking preservation projects. So those, that's kind of what we do as a commission. Um, we do have a few open spots. So if you're a Butte County resident and you're interested in preservation, talk to me. We can get you on the commission. It's really a fun way to stay a little more involved and stay more active with the preservation work that we do in the county. So the first thing I want everybody to do as we enter into this discussion, just kind of take a breath and settle down and don't come at me with your with your fists a swinging about that's not this style and that's not that style because historic styles are a very fluid kind of thing. It's a fluid way that we think about it. It's very much like art interpretation, whereas some people argue, they spend their whole lives arguing about what style is it, and that's not Romanesque, and that's not colonial, and we're not gonna do that today. We're not gonna argue about things. Although, I'm happy to talk with folks if you have different interpretations about what these things are or aren't, that's fine, but you're not gonna get a fight out of me. I'll be like, that's a good point, and we'll move on, because I, I, I've spent a lot of time uh, arguing with folks about what style things are, it's just not worth it, right? And I think the main reason is, so what I'm gonna primarily talk about are different characteristics of different structures. I need to be kind of a detective on your own and look for elements and start to piece it together. And without having to memorize in a very rote kind of way what is or isn't a particular historic style, just take it easy, look for different things and go, oh, that's got a little bit of this, and a little bit of that, and we move on, right? It's not, it's not something that we want to get too hung up about. So just keep that in mind as we go through, And but please, if you have any questions, let me know. Or I've always thought that that was a, an element of classicism, not Roman ask. Bring it up, that's fine, I don't care. So just let me know if you have any questions or observations. So the first thing that I, we're gonna go through, like when you first approach any kind of building, how do you look at it and what kinds of clues can you look for on any kind of structure that might help you determine what style it is? So one of the first things we look at are what, what age or era was it built? If you happen to know that, that's often a clue as to what style it is because just like fashion, just like bell bottoms or whatever, they're of a certain era. So architectural styles, just like fashion, change over time. So if you know a period when that building was built, there's a likelihood that it matches the style that was popular at that time. The other thing you can look for is if you happen to know who the architect was. Lots of architects work in a particular style, like they, they only worked in prairie style, or they only work in Romanesque styles and things like that. So that can also be a clue. If you know the function of the building, sometimes that can be a clue. Certain architectural styles are more prevalent with certain types of buildings. We'll see in a little bit, we'll see Gothic um, style. Gothic architecture is one of the styles we'll talk about. Gothic style is almost always either a church or an academic building. I don't know occasionally you might see a house or something, but you know, if it's a church or a, 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 like a university building, it's almost always Gothic, so that can be a clue. Um, it's siting or the neighborhood in which it was built can also help you identify a style. Sometimes architects would design an entire subdivision or they would, in, in, or there would be, if it's a residential neighborhood, it's unlikely that there'll be a style used there that's not common on residential architecture and things. So sometimes just the siting or the neighborhood that it's in also is a clue. The region uh, in which you are, at, in which you live, or where, where the building is, can also be a clue. Um, architecture is very regional. Um, some uh, architectural styles are common in the southwest, but not in the northeast, and all those sorts of things. So, keeping that in mind too. Um, sometimes you'll see outliers, like oh, there's a Mediterranean, like a Spanish Mediterranean style. How is it a view? 
it's uncommon, but it can happen. But that is what it, that can also help you uh, narrow in. Uh, the materials that are used in a building can also be a clue. Uh, lots of architectural styles are associated with a certain kind of building material, stone, brick, fiber, siding, those sorts of things. Or maybe it's a mixture of different materials on one building. So that can also help you uh, narrow in on what style it is. And sometimes it is going to be a mixture of styles. This, uh, this house, which is just right down the street here, the old Eaglehoff Casper uh, funeral home, um, this kind of a mixture of different styles. And you've got kind of these cobblestone on the side. You've got rounded corners like you would look. Should I stay right here? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the cute spot I should be standing on. Get in trouble here. But you've almost got some more. You see those little those windows up in the corner there? Those are almost like Moorish kinds of Oreo windows. There's all different kinds of styles mixed together here, so it's really hard sometimes to pinpoint. So a mixture of styles just makes it more fun, I guess, to really try to understand what some of these styles are. So we're just going to kind of go mostly chronological through these just to help you see the evolution of styles that we often see. So this is a vernacular. The vernacular style is mostly what we call commonly built buildings that weren't necessarily designed by an architect. And most buildings, especially in the early days of Iowa, were not designed by architects. You had craftsmen, carpenters, masons, farmers designing their own buildings. So we've got lots of different styles represented here. You can see you know, this is a neighborhood in downtown Dubuque where the buildings are all kind of built by a carpenter, right? One after the other, after the other, after the other. And it's kind of a vernacular style that doesn't necessarily pinpoint into a historical style. Houses, barns, sheds, outbuildings, this, these are not architect design things. One thing that has been identified, you can see in the lower right hand corner there, it says I house form. When I first saw that word, I thought, oh, is the building shaped like the letter I or something like that? No, it just means that a lot of them are in Iowa, Illinois, and Indiana. <laughs> That's why it's the I house. And you can see up in the top, uh, the, the, all six of those pictures, that that's the kind of form that you often see. So it's two, uh, it's a building that's two rooms wide, one room deep, with kind of the entry in the middle, and then oftentimes there'd be a, a kitchen built onto the back, like the front part of the house was probably built before plumbing, before electricity, and then when they got plumbing, they put a kitchen on the back, right? So that's kind of the eye house form that's been identified by academics and that's a common architectural vernacular style here in the Midwest. So very symmetrical, very easy to build. When you think about it, you're a farmer, you're a craftsman, who needs to put these buildings up quick. What size lumber do you have? How do you build it easily? And then just repeat that over and over again. Yes? If I could then, in your lower picture there, the second house in the blue, if you notice the curved windows up above, I mean, that can kind of maybe help you pin down a theme. Sometimes, yeah, so Tom pointed out the curved windows on that blue house there. Sometimes that can help with an age. I think it probably speaks more to the fact that the guy who owned that house probably worked at Farley and Lutcher. <laughs> Seriously. Yes, and, and he brought home some trim and he kind of came home and expanded the windows or put new windows in. Because you can see that it's the same, it's exactly the same as all the other houses. Yes. And, and you'll see that a lot in the view. Like, oh, why does that porch on the back have all that fancy, frilly, like, scroll work on the back? He probably worked at Carrasco, right? And he was a skilled tradesman and did that stuff, kind of like you. I know your house has all this kind of stuff on it, and, you know. Right. And uh, like I said, I told Cinder one time, like, in our house, even in the woodwork inside, it's probably like if you went out to Menards and they had a clearance of the stuff that isn't Vogue anymore. <laughs> and then so they bought that. That was part of it. And, and that is something to remember that, especially in these houses that were not necessarily designed by architects, you, they, were, they were pattern books and things. You, you, back in the day, they didn't have Menards or the internet, but they had pattern books. And, art, and, and builders could say, hmm, that was kind of a cool little corner, so I'm going to buy one of those. And they have it shipped from Sears Robot, right, to yeah, right. Yeah, and they put it up. Oh, you know, so it was just very, um, you know, so there, there was a lot of that going on, and you can, if more skilled people than me, can pick those kinds of things up. You have a question? What about Sears houses? The, uh, you know, uh, kit sort of thing, where you buy the uh, all specs there from Sears, and 
Yeah, would be in four hundred feet. Well, and the cool thing, was, so the, the the comment was about this: the Sears robust houses that would come get shipped on a rail car with the nails and the fixtures and the door handles and all that stuff was right there, and you assembled it. The interesting thing about those, and there's a whole realm of academia just centered on those, and people have websites to look at this. They go through towns and like, aha, there's one of the Sears houses. The Sears houses are challenging though because they were not confined to a particular style. You can buy a Cape Cod, you can buy a Queen Anne, you can buy a Spanish Revival, you can buy all these different kits from Sears. So they don't necessarily have a common historical style, but <coughs> the assembly style is what makes them unique and interesting. So another common vernacular style around here, that again, this is that idea of regionality. You're not gonna see these buildings in other regions of Iowa in particular, but in Dubuque, because we had so much stone and so many quarries, you will see a lot of stone vernacular houses in this area. Um, often these were built early on by immigrants and in the style of their home country. Uh, places like Luxembourg or um, St. Denavis, and these, you'll see buildings like this um, built out of native stone. Um, very narrow windows usually, very thick walls, and very few ornamental details because again, these were built by settlers, farmers, and things, not by architects. But very common style for some of the older buildings. This was really only common in pre-Civil War. The top building is on, uh, I think it's on Southern Avenue in Dubuque, and the bottom one is in Dyer's This is a style that's not very common in Dubuque, but we see, uh, but it's very, it's prominent mostly on the East Coast. Um, the, the federal or the colonial style, sometimes you see this called Georgian as well. Um, very simple and symmetrical, wood frame or brick. Not a lot of ornament on them. The ornament primarily <coughs> coming from the uh, kind of elegant uh, fenestration or the, the way the windows are displayed on the surface. Uh, but very, but not a super common. In fact, I don't think either one of these homes is in the view that is found in this on the internet somewhere. Just to give you an example of the style. But again, you see the, the time when this was very prominent, 1780s to the 1840s, the view was a dirt road settlement. There were, there were no architects designing buildings around the view at this time. So that's probably why it's not as common around here. Second Empire uh, style, you will see more of these buildings around Dubuque because again, if you match it up with the era in which a lot of these buildings were built, this is the time when Dubuque was booming, right? There were a lot, there was a lot of new wealth and a lot of buildings were being built here. The Second Empire style was primarily characterized by that mansard roof, roof where the shingles of the roof kind of wrap around down over the top story of the building. And then where those shingles wrap around, you'll have a dormer window the sound system is telling you not to go by the street. But the dormer windows are those, the windows that project out from the side of the building uh, right through the roof, that's called a dormer. So you'll see those commonly on these Second Empire buildings, along with prominent brackets. So the brackets are those, they look like little shelf brackets, right? Like you have on your shelf at home, right beneath the cornice. So the cornice is that horizontal strip that kind of usually separates the top of the building from the rest of the structure. So you've got yeah, very prominent brackets here, and then a lot of wrought iron features common, like you'll see on the old, the bare fever home up there, the wrought iron fence. Sometimes you'll have wrought iron railings on balconies, wrought windows and things on Second Empire buildings. Which empire is it referring to? Oh, uh, the French Empire. French. Yeah, yeah. The Mansard, the Mansard roof was pioneered in Paris. The story I've always heard is that an architect named Mansard, I suppose was his name, um, did that because they were taxing buildings based upon the number of floors they had below the roof. So if you could squeeze in another, if you could wrap the roof around, then that didn't count as a floor, so it didn't get taxed. Queen Anne, we have quite a bit of this in Butte County as well. This is a Victorian era style. Sometimes you will hear, the Victorian described, right, as an architectural style. This is, so the Victorian era was a lot longer, and there were several other periods within the Victorian era, like the Second Empire buildings are technically Victorian, right? They were in that Victorian age. 
So Queen Anne and Second Empire are kind of subsets of Victorian architecture. Yeah, I don't want to get into this too deep. <laughs> That's kind of how they how they think about it. Um, compared to like those federal, those federal and colonial styles, they're very asymmetrical. Like they're they're not the left half doesn't look like the right half all the time. Commonly you'll have these corner, these rounded corners or turrets. Uh, lots of porches on Queen Anne buildings. Sometimes you'll even have a porch on the second story, like where a bedroom door winds out onto a small porch. Um, also characterized often by different uh, textures of cladding on the exterior. You'll see on the one in the upper left hand corner, well, it's kind of got these scalloped almost fish scales on the turret, but then you've got regular clatter on the rest of the, uh, the building. So you'll see lots of mixtures of textures and um, building materials. Yes, sir. So were the turrets used for anything in particular? Just ornamental, just decorative. I mean, it makes very dramatic spaces inside the house. <laughs> Um, but, but they were not commonly done. They weren't for a specific purpose, if that's what you mean. It was just in kind of a lovely little sitting area or whatever inside the house. So again, we'll see. These are both in view. This, this, this is a pretty common Victorian style that we see. Um, another, you'll see that it's kind of got that equilateral, equilateral triangle there, that gable on the end. That's another quite common feature on lots of Queen Anne buildings. There's lots of interesting geometry kind of all mixed in together. So Mandolin Inn was the great style to be school mm -hmm. Is that true to you? Um that's I would almost characterize it. It's it's got that Victorian feel to it, but the, because of the, the green shingles, the, the tile shingle on it and the brick that they use for it, it almost looks a little more Romanesque to me in a lot of ways. But again, it's very these things blend together quite a bit. And one reason why these styles blend together is a lot of architects, especially, and not all these buildings were designed by architects, but if an architect was involved, a lot of architects didn't want to get put in a box. Like, oh, he's the guy that does all the Victorian. No, I don't, I do other things. And they would kind of put things in there that made theirs look different than other architects. So it makes it really squishy sometimes because no one wants to be you know, characterized as that guy who does this. So it really adds a lot of ambiguity to some of the designs on these. This is a very common style in Dubuque. If you look at the era, again, in which these buildings were commonly built from the 1840s to the 1880s, lots of building and development happening in Dubuque. So, and one of the reasons why this style was so common in Dubuque is because the materials for this kind of building were readily available here. Uh, most of these buildings would have a rough stone foundation. And then up above, in the upper right hand corner, this is more the uh, Italian villa style, right? And think about the Ham House and other buildings that are, there's a nice example of this right down on Locust Street here in Dubuque, where you've got very simple building materials that were commonly available here. And then on the top, this is a, a frame building with clabbered. You've got a belvedere. So that's what that little cupola at the top is called a belvedere, or a, a lookout, or a widow's walk, you hear it called sometimes. In the commercial application down below, this was quite common because the brick that's used in these Italian storefronts is just a common brick that was really easy to acquire. And then the beauty, the beautiful ornamental details, were these decorative lintels, or that little cap at the top of each window, and the decorative cornice that caps off the top of the building is where a lot of the beauty was um, added through those details, which were commonly available either to be shipped here or made locally. And these Italian buildings, some have real decorative lintels, and some are just like a, a limestone slab, but still considered Italian. On a lot of the buildings too, especially in downtown Dubuque, if they had retail on the base, they wanted to bring lots of natural light into those retail spaces in an era in which um, electricity was either non-existent or very uncommon. And if you did have electricity, the lights were very small and they get a very little light and a ton of heat. So you couldn't rely upon them to display your goods for sale. So they wanted to put in these large plates of glass. And in this era, they were developing the technology to have large plate glass windows, which was a relatively new development. And then luckily here at Dubuque, we also had um, uh, boat manufacturers that had big 
uh, that have big factories for building like boilers and parts for steam engines and things. And while they were building all these giant building parts, they would also build cast iron storefronts. So the columns and the frames for the windows were made out of cast iron right here in Butte. So as you're going through downtown Butte, this is right on Main Street in downtown Butte, look at the bottom of those cast iron columns. You'll often see Rouse and Dean Foundry or Iowa Ironworks or uh, Clower Manufacturing things. A lot of those were made right here in Butte. So that really added to the popularity of this style because a lot of the materials were right here in Butte. The bricks, the lintels, the storefronts were all right here. In fact, a lot of river towns up and down the Mississippi, you'll find this style very commonly because if it was available here in Butte, that also meant that they could ship it via steamboats and rail easily up and down the Mississippi. So you see lots of river towns that have this uh, style of architecture, um, but very common here. This one's also probably very familiar. If any of you are in a, especially in small towns around the view, you'll see a lot of these American four square buildings. It's called four square because every floor usually has four identical rooms on the main floor. One, two, three, four, around this like a central staircase. First floor, second floor, um, with a large hip roof, often with dormers. There's those dormers again, those little projections that project out of the roof. Um, very boxy shapes, and again, these were done based upon the size of the building materials that they could easily acquire. So the size of those rooms was kind of dictated by the size of the lumber you could purchase from the local mills. And then they would box those up and put them in, put them in four squares, build two of them, put a roof on, and you were done. So these are not, uh, these are usually not architect design, but they can be. Sometimes, especially if they have more uh, ornamental flourishes and things, they might be architect design. A lot of times they'll have a little bit deeper or wider um, hip roof on the top, eaves on the top, uh, often with a wide porch the one on top. That's a new get, I think, has been screened in or boxed in. The one down below, this is in Holy Cross, and the um, porch looks more like it would have been its original style. A lot of times you'll see these buildings with prairie style or craftsman elements as well, because these were built in that period, 1895 to 1929, when the prairie style and the craftsman style were very popular. So you'll see those elements often incorporated. Sometimes you'll see these in stucco as well, these big four squares, not so much around the view, but um, you will see this style in stucco too. Classical Revival was a very common style. Um, if you were a trained architect in the United States, it probably meant that you went to study in Paris, France at the Ecole de Beaux-Arts in Paris, France, if you wanted to be a classically trained architect. A little later on, places like MIT and schools like that in the United States also trained and certified architects, but they copied their curriculum from the Ecole de Beaux-Arts in Paris. And the way they taught architecture was, as an architect, you would spend your entire college career learning how to copy these Greek and Roman historic styles. Like you would sit down at a drafting board and you would copy the Corinthian cornice. You would copy the Doric columns. You would copy the facade of the Parthenon and things over and over and over again until you got really good at it. That was classical architectural training in this period. So if you were a trained architect, this was the most familiar style for you typically. The other element that made this style very prominent was the 1893 World's Columbian Exposition in Chicago, where the White City, Daniel Burnham designed this White City on the shores of Michigan, Lake Michigan, and it was all done in this classical style. So it just, architecture is a fad, it's a fashion. So it became very fashionable to design buildings in this architectural style. After 1893, you really see this explode all across the United States, but particularly in the Midwest. So um, it's a very symmetrical style, usually, where the, you, the front, you know, the left and the, and the right of the building look uh, just like each other. And with all the classical elements you can imagine from the Parthenon or whatever incorporated into your building, you know, the Carnegie Stout Library that we're in right now is one of the best examples we have in the view of this style. But you also see classical styles on things like the security building downtown view, the German bank building in view. Um, now, the Carnegie Stout Library um, 
is carved stone. Well, all the ornament, ornament is carved stone. But on the security building and the German bank building, all of the ornament is done in terracotta. So this is another reason why this style became popular, because it was also around this time that factories learned how to make terracotta ornament look just like stone. So terracotta is a baked, 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 baked clay material where you sculpt ornament out of clay, bake it at high heat, and it comes out very durable and just kind of like a flower pot. It's kind of the same material. And they developed a technique so they could make a mold and they would push the wet clay into that mold, take it out and bake it, use that same mold to make the exact same piece of ornament, take it out, and they use those molds over and over again to replicate things that, like on the Carnegie Stop Library, each one of those, the capitals on those Corinthian columns might have taken weeks for an artisan to carve. Now suddenly you can get the same ornamental look from that pink clay coming over and over again, manufactured in a factory. So that was, a, that was one, one, another reason why this style became so popular, because it became much more cost efficient to put all of that ornament on buildings. So the, so the security building and the German bank building are all clad in terracotta. Now on the German bank building, they also added a glaze to the terracotta, just like a, you, a, you can have a coffee mug that's raw clay, or you can put a, a glaze on it before you bake it, and it's got that colored patina on it, right? So they found out ways to make that glaze look just like stone. So you could put the same color stone in the same kind of um, patterns on it that would replicate marble or limestone and things like that. The next time you're down at 14th and Central, the old db and building is right there. Take a close look at that. It looks, oh, look at that beautiful limestone building. It's glazed terracotta. <laughs> Go up and knock on it with your knuckles and it's hollow. But it looks just like stone. So they became very good at this. And to your point too about like the Sears houses, like ordering all these things out, Architects could go through pattern books and say, ooh, I'd like a swag, and I'd like you know, a lion's head, and I'd like a printing column, and oh wait, no, hold on, let's make a bionic instead. And they'd just order them, and they would, they would be delivered then to the job site to the right specs. So that's, what, that's why you'll see a lot of the same repeated ornament, like on the security building below those arches, you see those like ornamental swags of vegetation there? That's just out of a pattern book. That they would then they would order the right number and put them right in there, and I, I, that's why I love the German bank building too because the architects had a really good catalog <laughs> and ordered one of everything, give me one of everything because it's got one of everything on it. That was really great. And usually, um, usually uh, this kind of Beaux Arts classical revival style is on commercial or institutional buildings. You don't see a ton of this on residents. It's a little more unusual. You'll see elements of it. You'll see a little triangular pediment or something over the porch, but you won't see a whole building that looks like Carnegie style design for residential. Adam, I have a question about this building actually. Which building? So the columns out front, mm -hmm. are they solid stone or are they wrapped around like a steel column? That's a good question. They're probably not, um, they're not terribly uh, structural. You know, they're not holding up anything beyond that pediment. Mm -hmm. They're probably, they're probably, are, I, I don't know if they're solid stone, they might be hollow stone, but right. I think they are stone. Yeah. But they might have even hollowed them out just to make them less heavy, because mm -hmm. otherwise they'd be monumentally heavy if they were solid stone. Right. But yeah, I think, and they're in segments. Yeah. Sometimes, like in Chicago, you go to buildings and they'll have columns that height made out of single pieces of granite. You know, they brought these things in on railroad cars and they weigh hundreds of tons each, you know, put them up. And these are not quite that elaborate. But that's a good question. I don't really know the answer to your question. I can just speculate. Okay, so just a curiosity the security building, mm -hmm. was Stanford's? Stanford's part of school, yeah. I worked there. I oh. worked up there where the arts is. Oh, there <laughs> In the credit office, yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah, the Stanford's building is kind of interesting because even though Stanford's department store was in there, there was always part of it that was always leased for other commercial clients, and they had another entrance kind of around the side of the building to go up into the other leased office space up above. Yeah, but most of the would recognize that as Stanford's. But 
when it was originally built, even though it was built for the Stanford company, they always called it the security building. Even though Stanford's was the company that actually built it. There was a Mr. Stanford. There was, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, and, they, and they're the ones that commissioned this building. But I think to get those other commercial tenants, they didn't want to call it the Stanford's building, so they called it the security building, so they could have these other tenants who didn't maybe want their address to be Stanford's apartment store. Good questions, everyone. Any questions? So well, this is one of my favorite architectural styles. I love these Romanesque buildings. Um, a lot of times you'll hear this called Richardsonian Romanesque because the architect H. H. Richardson from Boston was the, one of the primary builders in this style, or designers in this style. Um, again, very popular, right? This was popular before the 1893 World's Fair. And what we see in this Richardsonian, especially Richardsonian Romanesque, is that oftentimes these buildings started to break free from a lot of that classical, rigid, like Beaux Arts classicism? They were starting to do different things. First of all, in most of the buildings, like the one on the top right and this lower one, they're very asymmetrical, which was not something you would see in classical architecture very often. It was always very left, right, or mirror images of each other. The Grand Opera House up here is obviously very symmetrical, but we, all, we do have some of the other Romanesque characteristics. Um, so this was kind of getting popular before the World's Fair, 1893, and then when that came, bam! Suddenly everybody wanted those classical Greek and Roman temples. So it kind of put the kibosh on a lot of this Richardsonian style, and, and especially some of the boundaries that it was starting to push. Because one of the hallmarks and interesting parts of some of these Romanesque buildings, like St. Luke's down here, some of the column capitals and things that you'll see are very stylized. Like they don't just look like a Corinthian column, like from the Greek and Roman style. They're a little more abstracted, a little more geometric, a little more like modern looking. And even on the um, Grand Opera House, if you get up close and look at the where those uh, rounded arches come down, there's some wonderful ornament carved into the, the granite down there. And it's very stylized and modern looking. It's not like what you think of from Greek and Roman times. So I always kind of feel like the Richardsonian Romanesque style kind of got cut off before it really became a flourishing thing. Um, a lot of um, Richardsonian Romanesque style buildings use this rusticated stone. And when I say rusticated stone, we often think about stone like we have on St. Luke's down here that's very roughly hewn. But in classical architecture, rustication just means that the, the stone itself extends out beyond the mortar lines. So sometimes, like if you're in New York City and things, you go to the, the Metropolitan Museum of Art and stuff, it doesn't have this rough hewn stone, but it'll, have, but it'll almost look like a cut gemstone like where you've got a geometric square in the middle of a big block that kind of comes and sticks out beyond the end of the block. That's also rustication, even though it's not like roughly hewn stone. So that's kind of a, an interesting, like when you hear rusticated stone, it's not always going to be this. But a lot of, especially um, this Romanesque style, uses that really rough hewn stone at the base and very thick walls. This was an architectural style that really wanted to exude this idea of permanence. These buildings are not going anywhere, so you got these big, thick walls, and oftentimes they are battered at the bottom, which means that the buildings actually kind of get wider at the base and then kind of go down, just looking really strong and steady. So lots of that kind of uh, imagery in Romanesque architecture. Um, and then the rounded arches are also one of the things that even if you've got something that's kind of classically designed, if it's got a, a rounded arch, someone's like, no, 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 I think that's a little wrong arch. Because it's got the rounded arch. Because it's very common. Um, you can see it's, you know, all of these buildings have these rounded arches in it, which is a, a real sign of that style. Well, we've got some great examples of this style in Dubuque, right across the street. The old Bishop's residence is a wonderful example of a Romanesque style. Gothic revival, uh, very common around here, largely on churches, um, uh, as we mentioned before. Um, this became, you know, this is one of those um, styles that was brought over, a, a European revival style, characterized by 
narrow windows, pointed arches. You can see in all of these buildings, the arches above and the windows are all pointed. We've got very elaborate kind of lacy um, ornaments on all of the windows. Um, if it looks like a four-leaf clover that only has three lobes, that's a trefoil. If it's got four, it's a quatrefoil. You will see examples of all of those on these buildings. Lots of little trim and lacy trim around some of the edges and the eaves. Um, the other thing that's really characteristic of that style are these buttresses. Right here, right here. You can see these buttresses right there. This is, even though none of these, well, actually I should say none of these buildings, when Gothic cathedrals were built exclusively with masonry, like with no steel supports, with no big timbers or anything in them, one of the big innovations on Gothic cathedrals was that they had these great big stained glass windows to glorify God, to let the light in, and you know, to kind of bring the sense of awe. That was the big innovation. But to get those big, wide expanses, uh, and very tall, in Gothic cathedrals, they had to find a way to support those walls, even though they weren't real thick and deep. Because thick and deep was the only way you could make a tall building in the Middle Ages. It had to be thick, it had to be deep, because you're stacking stone upon stone. And anybody who's ever done that with your grandkids or your little kids or whatever, pretty soon it starts to go like this unless you make the base real wide. But they didn't want these big, thick walls in Gothic cathedrals. They wanted them thin, so they had this beautiful stained glass coming through. And if you had thick walls, you couldn't put big windows in. So the innovation that they came up with was to make the wall thin, but to build a buttress out. And that buttress would brace that, if you only had a very thin column, that buttress would go outside the building and brace it up. And you've seen some of these Gothic cathedrals in Europe where they've got these big arms, right, that kind of come up and attach to the outside. That's to hold the wall up so that it doesn't collapse because of those big, beautiful stained glass windows. So in Gothic style, none of these buildings need those buttresses to stand up, but it's a remnant of that Gothic style. You can still see them in these Gothic uh, churches that we have all over the county. Uh, a lot of um, another hallmark of this Gothic style is they're very vertical. Like so, the vertical aspects of the building are very accentuated, you know, to the to glorify God. Yes, sir. Where are those churches at? I don't see the top. The middle one is in Bankston. Tim and Adam can probably help me out on this. They might know. The top one's in is Saint um, Saint Clement's in Bankston. Uh, the one in the lower left is St. Matthias in Cascade. No, that's in New Vienna, sorry. No. And then the one in the lower right is in Cascade, St. Thomas Aquinas. Or St. Matthias, it's St. Thomas Aquinas pastor in the St. Matthias <laughs> church. Just where it's at. Sorry, pardon? Just where it's at, I don't know. Okay, yeah. Yeah, but these are all around the Duke County. <clears throat> St. Mary's here in view, uh, uh, St. Raphael's Cathedral, they're all in a similar Gothic style. So we have a real, we have a wide range of different revival styles um, in the Duke County as well. I didn't want to devote a single slide to each one of these because there's so many different ones. Um, the old jail in Dubuque here is uh, Egyptian revival. Um, the, the cornice at the top kind of has the silhouette of a papyrus plant. And you'll see like right around the entrances, there are like bundled reeds that look like Egyptian architecture. And there's um, uh, winged lions and all these kinds of things that you would see commonly uh, in uh, Egyptian style. It's one of the only Egyptian revival buildings in Iowa. It's probably our most unique historic building in, our, in the whole county. Then we've got some of the English cottage revival style over there. In the upper right, there's a Tudor revival. We've got Spanish revival down here in the lower left. We've got more Tudor there on the lower right. So lots of you know copying historic, usually European styles into a modern uh, vernacular. And there's there's too many of these different styles for me to devote too much time to, but there's a good, there's a pretty good sampling of them in here. What makes a Tudor style a Tudor? Tudor, um, usually you've got very steep roofs and very, and very narrow gables, like that one up on the right, and, and this one with the very, the very steep gable on the entrance. Mm -hmm. A lot of times you'll have half timbers, 
where it'll be uh, white stucco with big brown half timbers. There aren't really any good examples of that in the view, so that's why I didn't put any of those in here. Um, a lot of times they'll have features like these kind of cat slide roofs um, and very narrow windows usually, or a cluster of narrow windows grouped together is very characteristic of the Peter style. English cottage kind of. Yes, Adam? So anything revival kind of gives the indication that you're trying to repeat something from the past. So is there like an original architectural style of Egyptian or Spanish is very particular mm -hmm. versus revival. Are there any modern revival styles that are being used today? Like using historic styles like these in modern homes? Yeah. Or? yeah. Um, so is there any like modern construction that you could point to and say this is a revival style of, or is that not something that's being done anymore? No, it definitely happens. Um, I mean, a lot of times, especially in modern homes, you'll see small elements kind of added onto a larger building that's not necessarily part of a cohesive style. Like they'll, they'll add on like, oh, let's put a little half timbering on here, that'll be cuter. It's like nothing else about this building is cuter, right? <laughs> Because I think that's what's more curious. When I think about these revival styles from, especially this, most of these were built in the old days, like the 1860s, that's much earlier. But a lot of these other ones probably are from the 19 teens up through the 20s. They're very cohesive and integrated into a, a coherent style. Like they're not just slapping on a thatched roof. Like the whole thing is integrated together into a, a, a cohesive style. So I think that's what was more common with these revival styles back then. So to your point, I think in modern times, we aren't quite as thorough in how we try to say, yes, this is gonna be an English cottage. Well, just because you put a little exposed stone or something on the, the big brick entrance doesn't mean it's an English cottage. Does that help? Yep. Okay. Yes, yeah. Why the Egyptian? Hmm. Good question. In this era, it actually, it actually, um, recalls back to the philosophy of uh, penitentiaries and jailing people at the time. There was there was a sense of um, redemption in the afterlife. Like they were trying to, as you try to reform um, criminals and things, they thought they're going to pass through this building into the afterlife. So a lot of jails and things built in this time, they used Egyptian mythology kind of as this idea of passage into the afterlife of after your day you're gonna emerge into a new life. And that, sim that symbolism and mythology from Egypt really resonated with them at the time. That's a really good question. How did it end up in the view? <laughs> well, this was this was a building that was designed by an architect. So a trained architect, so who was very steeped in historic styles. So he was trained on, so this isn't just like the local sheriff decided, hey, let's do Egyptian, right? <laughs> it, was, it, was, it was a trained architect who designed this. Um, and, and was probably very keyed into the trends of the time, which was to design jails and prisons in Egyptian style. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Any questions? So as we kind of get up closer, a little deeper into the 20th century here, the arts and crafts and prairie style and craftsmen, I kind of lumped all those together. They share a lot of common elements, even though each one of those, and this is where if there's any architecture purists in the crowd, they can just roll on down there, notebooks and storing out because I lump these things all together, but we gotta do what we gotta do. So um, a lot of them, uh, the reason I clump them all together is they share a similar aesthetic where they're really trying to focus on something that's uniquely American. Uh, there's a uniquely American style to the prairie, especially the prairie style aesthetic. The architects were trying to say, we are breaking free from Europe. We are breaking free from all other things. And what's uniquely American? The prairie. But in, in Europe doesn't have these big, open, flat areas. So let's use that as our inspiration. And not only to use, like, especially the, uh, the stone shelter building up there at the Eagle Point Park, very flat and horizontal and kind of emerging right out of the hillside using native stone and native materials and things. 
And those architects wanted to play upon that uniquely American landscape feature and really can really celebrate that as something that no other place had. A lot of other, like a lot of ornament that you'll find on prairie buildings, also the, the, the vegetation and things that they use as inspiration for the ornament is like sumac and thistles and things that you would find on an American prairie. They're not using a campus leaves. You know, on a, on a Corinthian column from Greece that has a campus leaves or palm fronds or papyrus. They don't have that stuff here. So they use American native plants as the inspiration for their ornament. Um, a lot of times, too, both the prairie style craftsmen and arts and crafts were very focused on natural materials that are clearly made by people but, and by craftsmen, but, also, but often using machines. So lots of wood, and you'll see lots of stucco and things on, these, uh, on a lot of these prairie uh, style buildings. Um, a lot of them had stylized geometric shapes kind of on them that were kind of abstracted. Um, anybody who's seen Frank Lloyd Wright's stained glass windows, you know, they're, they're inspired by nature, but still very modern and abstract. So all of these um, um, styles kind of pulled into that same tradition. Very wide overhanging eaves, which often, especially on the stone shelter building, and even this uh, large house up on uh, up in the Langworthy district, kind of gives it a sense of horizontality. So that means you have these big eaves that stretch off of the building. So you'll see this style quite a bit in Iowa, just because Frank Lloyd Wright's home and studio was in Oak Park, Illinois, and also Taliesin in Spring Green, which is just not that far from here. Yes. Talk about the building. So the building on the lower right, that's in Cascade, and I put that into this um, into this kind of craftsman uh, slide because this was applied onto commercial buildings sometimes. And a lot of the woodwork or the ornament, which again you can see here at the entrance, is very stylized and uses more American inspiration for the, um, in the vegetation that was inspired by it. A lot of times you'll see um, these commercial buildings that are inspired by the craftsmen here. Like I would also say the building, um, the building down in the Millwork district that was the old headquarters for the Cradfield building, that's on the corner of Washington and 9th or 11th. It kind of stands out by itself. It's the Seven Hills Event Center. It's also in a similar style, kind of in a, a more modern, but it's, it's not quite like a modern commercial style, but it's also not a historic style. It's kind of in this transition period. Yes? What's the uh, house on the top right? Looks like a gamble house. Oh, top right, that's four miles. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah, oh, yeah. the burden oh, home, yeah. home, four miles. Yeah. Yeah. So moving up, you know, through the various areas here, we've got Art Deco and Streamline Modern. Uh, we don't have a zillion examples of this in Dubuque. Just a lot of buildings weren't being built here in the 20s and 30s in Dubuque. So we don't have great examples. But this is mostly characterized by, they were really trying to modernize these historic styles into a modern age. Streamlining the buildings, taking off extraneous ornament, and celebrating the speed and streamlining that you were seeing on things like those big steamships or those wonderful like locomotives that you'd see that were all streamlined and, it's, and you know, airplanes and all these things that were modern and speedy and fast, they were bringing that style into uh, architecture. So streamlining it and really making it seem a lot more modern, uh, um, uh, <clears throat> a more modern machine age. And in places where you do have historic ornament on some of these buildings, like the federal building in view, it has eagles on it, and it's got columns between the windows, but they're stylized and streamlined, and they're kind of recessed back down into the building. So they're, you read them as columns, but instead of having that soft scoop fluting, they might be jagged. They might be more zigzag shaped, more abstracted, more geometric. So they're taking these things, and even the eagles that you have on the post office building, Instead of being slapped onto the building, they're carved into the living stone of the building itself, kind of making it seem more streamlined and integrated. So you see that a lot more in Art Deco. Um, 
This is the City Hall building in Farley, which is a, actually a poor concrete building, which is really interesting, but very streamlined and smooth. This is the old funeral home down in Iowa and 15. And then the post office, and then that's a really great, the Butler home in uh, Milwaukee, which is a great example of that streamlined old man style. We see this more, a lot in like skyscraper, like Rockefeller Plaza in New York, or you know the Board of Trade building in Chicago, or this Art Deco style, like really streamlined and vertical and shooting up into outer space. Old school on Central, is it? Yeah, it's from the same era. Yeah, yeah. Fulton and Bryant and Lincoln, they were all built around the same time. So moving up into the modern age, um, from the 1940s up through the 1970s. Um, sometimes you'll see the style called the international style. Um, you won't, you will, unlike Art Deco, where you will see some references to historic architecture, this kind of architecture usually rejects those kinds of historic connections as trying to build something uniquely modern and new. Um, if they celebrate the new modern materials that they're being used to build these things, so you'll see lots of steel and glass prominently used as an ornamental feature on modern buildings. Very little applied ornament. And you'll also see a lot more frequently, like in the Divine Word College, the function of the buildings themselves and what's happening inside the buildings is kind of projected outward onto the surface of the building. So if you think about that being Divine Word College, that part that we're seeing there with all the windows, that's the library at Divine Word College. Now, think about the building that we're in. Carnegie South Library, what that looked like with the big stone columns and the pediments and stuff. When you look at that building, you don't know necessarily what's happening inside that building. Is it an office building or a school or a library? And if it is a library, where are the staffs? Where are the offices? Where are the classrooms? You can't tell. On a building, on a modern building, oftentimes the architects want to show you. So if you're at Divine Word, you can see where the library is, you can see where the chapel is, you can see where the classrooms are, you can see where the dorms are by standing outside because the building changes depending on what's happening inside of it. So that's a very modern concept. The classical architects were not concerned with that. The building has to be symmetrical no matter what. If there's an auditorium in there, make it fit. If there's a library staff inside, make it fit. But don't, don't show us on the outside. But in modernism, they're a little more concerned with that kind of thing. So this was very popular after the 1940s, largely because architects and people, especially people building institutions, banks and corporations and things like that, were consciously rejecting historic styles, largely because the symbol of a lot of fascism and uh, uh, authoritarian regimes was the architecture of classical Greeks and Romans. The Roman Empire was the inspiration for a lot of the imperialism of the 20th century. They wanted to build a new Roman Empire and take over the world and design it to look like the Roman Empire. And after World War, after the death and destruction of World War I and World War II, they said, if that's the style that the fascists are using, maybe we should do something else. That reflects our modern age of enlightenment so they really rejected a lot of that historic style in favor of something that was a little more futuristic looking, like let's look to the future in a more hopeful future without all the death and destruction. And we don't have a lot of great architecture in this style in Newton either. Um, a lot of the wonderful examples of this style were along Dodge Street. Um, hotels and restaurants and office buildings done in this really cool, streamlined, beautiful, modern style, and they all got torn down when Dodge Street came through. And one of the things that I always tell people like you as we think about the style is, this is, these buildings are 50 years old. These are historic structures. This is our history, like we grew up with these buildings, right? We all, this was part of our childhood, and seeing these buildings, this, these are historic. And we as a society are utterly unprepared to preserve these buildings as a historic style. Eh, tear them down. It's too hard to reuse it, it's too hard to restore. Tear them down. Those buildings are new, they're modern, tear them down. These are actually historic buildings. We've got to figure that out. Because I remember 
you see stories all the time when they've torn down a beautiful old historic buildings in Utah or elsewhere. How could they have done that? That is the most beautiful historic structure. We're doing that now. Put these. And our grandkids are going to look back and say, oh, how could they have torn down that beautiful bank building? That's right. Because they didn't value it. So that's part of why we do these talks, right? Just help people see these as legitimate, thoughtful, intentional historic styles that should be preserved, even if you don't like it. I don't know, I'm not really keen on, the, on that modern style, but they should be preserved. It's part of our history, right? They're not all good. Like, there's good steel and glass boxes, and there's bad steel and glass boxes. Like, this one here at the U.S. Bank building that's right up the street here is a good one. The Vine Wood is a good one. These little, we got some of these modern homes in here. They're good. We should say that right? as, as, a, as a symbol of, of our cultural heritage. All right, moving up into the modern contemporary age, um, it's very difficult to characterize modern architecture into a single style. Um, most architects, especially now, are very consciously trying to break free and create their own styles and not be pigeonholed into a small, tiny little category. So there's not an easy way to say, oh, that's this style and that's that style. We'll let historians figure that out. Like in 30 years, someone's gonna look back on this age and see what, what are we doing here, what's going on. One thing we do know is that we just saw those buildings built from the 40s up through the 70s that were very clean and sleek and geometric with not a lot of ornament. There was, uh, there was a movement, you know, the pendulum eventually swung the other way and people said, ah, oh, those buildings have no character, they've got no style, let's do something, let's, let's go back the other way. So we started seeing buildings like this built in the 90s that started to once again refer back to historic styles. So from the 80s up through the early 90s, we saw something called a post-modern era, where people were now rejecting the modern era and trying to bring back some of the, what they saw as the positive characteristics of historic styles into more modern buildings. So even though this is a modern building, it's making direct reference, right, to the original American Trust building. These arched windows are almost direct replicas of the ones at the top of the tower. So you're taking historic styles and bringing them up into the modern um, age. A lot of times they might be exaggerated. Um, uh, Clark University there, the new atrium building that was built after the fire there, certainly makes references to the buildings that were there before. The brick and the, the kind of Gothic arches and the Gothic, it was all referring to what burned. So they were bringing up into the modern age. But then you've got buildings like the Grand River Center down there in the lower right hand corner that isn't specific to a particular style, but it certainly is contextual, right? It's not, a lot of buildings in the 50s and 60s said this building could be built anywhere. There's no tie to its context at all. This building clearly, you couldn't put that building anywhere else. The, 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 the big prow sticking out over the river wouldn't make sense in downtown Dubuque, but it makes perfect sense here. And you know, the native stone and kind of the nautical themes that seem to tie into the river make it make sense there. So buildings like the Grand River Center seem to have a little more relevance, even though they're very modern. No one's going to mistake that for a historic building, but it's, it has a little more context to it and it seems feels more like us. It doesn't just feel like this international building that can be built anywhere in the world. So I think this is kind of the direction that a lot of uh, architecture is heading right now. Does anybody have any questions? That kind of brings us up to the present day, but I'm happy to entertain any questions or comments anybody might have. Yes? Is there a, a kind of formal uh, affiliation between the uh, county historic preservation and the National Trust for historic preservation? Is there a formal connection between our county commission and the National Trust for Historic Preservation? No, there's not. Um, informal? Oh, well, informal in that we would work with people who are trying to apply for like the National Register of Historic Places. Like we would certainly help be the liaison between a resident seeking that and the National Trust. Or, I mean, the National Trust isn't really even the one that does that work. You know, they're the, they support it, but the Department of Interior actually designates the landmarks and things. So there's it's a very complicated structure. Even here in Butte County, you know, we've got the Butte County Historic Preservation Group, but there's also a landmarks division at the city of Butte. 
So in the Landmarks Commission for the city only does the city, we cover the whole county. But the Landmarks Commission entity has ordinances and things that they can enforce. Like if there's a, a designated historic district in Dubuque and you're in that district, there are certain things you can and can't do with your historic home. Whereas in the county, I don't have any codes to enforce. Someone has a historic home out in Dubuque County and they want to tear it down, they do. Like I can't stop them. There's no ordinances to stop that in the county. Is there a state level? No. Well, there is a state level historic preservation uh, commission, yeah, but they also don't have any ability to stop the destruction of historic property. But they do lots of funding and things. Well, most the grant, the, the, the state historic preservation office does mostly grant making for people who are seeking to preserve their historic homes. It's very multi layered and complicated. <laughs> Yes. Um, I'm not a native to Buker, um, but one of the, I don't know if you call it a residential style or it was made from a kit or whatever that I've heard about here is the John Deere homes. Oh, yeah. Can you say yeah. something about those? Yeah, so the question was about the John Deere homes. So in that post war era, when the population was growing and they needed workers for the John Deere factory out of the north end of Butte, the, the John Deere bought a bunch of property on the west side and built a whole, several neighborhoods full of homes that were all very similar to each other. Um, very small, like single family homes that were meant as kind of starter homes for the returning GIs who were working at the John Deere factory. So there's a very common, art. this is it's off of Asbury Road, kind of between Asbury and Hillcrest, kind of, out in that neighborhood across from like where the Bell Tower Theater is. If you keep going south out of there, you'll see this John Deere neighborhood. Um, they're, they're, they're not even really ranch style, like they're very small um, and they have like stone and fabric and stuff on them, but they look fairly modern. They look like 40s and 50s homes, but that's where they're mostly concentrated. And I think Tim might even know better than me, but they're, they're trying to landmark that district, right? They're turning that into a designated landmark district so that they are preserved. So it's a really good example of preserving something that most people think of as modern. So turning it into a historic district so that it's preserved. Is that helpful? Okay. I don't know who the architect or anything was, but yeah. So following up with her question, um, that being done even today, where they build massive amounts of homes that look similar together, in the future when we go to designate, designate those as being historic, what style would we classified as that, or do we not know yet? I don't think we really know yet. Um, in order to be designated as a landmark district, there has to be something either architecturally architecturally or historical, historically significant right. about those buildings. So like in the John Deere neighborhood instance, there's a sociological reason to landmark that because it speaks to a really important part of Duke's history I think that would be one of the things you'd have to look at in one of those residential neighborhoods you're describing, like out in Piazza or something. Right. Like, what's the sociological significance of this? Is there architectural significance? Because you have to designate all that stuff on your landmarks right. application. For some of those neighborhoods you're describing, it'd be very difficult okay. to establish significance. You know what I mean? Because there's, there's lots of residential that. neighborhoods in the view too, like with historic homes in them, right? It would be really hard to turn into landmark districts. Yeah. It's like they're nice, they're interesting, they're quaint, but there's nothing maybe architecturally significant about them. Okay. You know what I mean? Like so you'd have to have a, a really interesting narrative of significance to make those make the case. Because because I, I think very few preservationists say we should preserve everything. Right? It's not getting you, but <laughs> but but you know, but I think there are choices that have to be made sometimes about what is significant enough to preserve. Because it takes a ton of resources, as you know, to preserve something, and it's easier sometimes to tear it down. So I think you have to make the choice at some point. Okay, just a couple of questions because we got to be out of here in about three minutes, so for another call, uh, event. And not to embark you on another hour presentation, but. Within the county, are there historic farms or barns? There are a lot of historic agricultural sites, barns and farms and things like that. But I don't know, there, and there are a handful, like maybe one or two, that are designated National Historic Landmarks. Um, 
But unlike the city of Butte, there isn't a county designation for a landmark district. So you either are in the city of Dubuque and you're a designated Dubuque landmark, or you are a national historic landmark. There's no county or state level designation. So beyond uh, like the occasional tour of historic barns, my dad is here, he's got a historic barn over there. You know? And there are a few, but they aren't necessarily landmarks. And so I don't know if that answers your question or not, but yeah. Yeah, one more question, um, Marie. Jason, um, the aluminum houses I've, that are in the are they kind of like on the border of a series of Roblox where people ordered them and built them? Yeah, people you're talking about is the Lustron homes, is that right? There's one in South Grandview, I know. Yeah. Like yeah. Yeah, so the, the Lustron homes were, again, a post war um, invention to uh, satisfy the housing boom. Like, so many people needed homes that they were trying to manufacture as many homes as possible. And Lustron homes were, again, something you could buy as a kit. So they're enameled steel panels and steel um, two by fours and steel everything would come in and you bolted it together. And they were manufactured homes that were meant to be manufactured rapidly. There's one on South Grand View, there's one up here on, well, there's one on West Locust, there's one up on the terrace. Uh, was it Mon not Montrose Stairs? Is it Montrose Stairs? Oh, there's, so there's three or four of them. Yeah. No. But yeah, that was a post war thing. Okay. So I think we're going to have to call it a day right there because I know there's another event coming up. But thank you so much for coming.